I upcycle um, glass bottles and glass containers into household goods, ranging from water tumblers to flower vases to candle holders, bowls, ashtrays, etc. etc. I had had this itch for a long time to start my own venture. I knew it had to be creative. I've been a designer my whole life. I was a design teacher before starting this. But I was ready to start working with my hands. And so um, when I quit my job, I didn't really have a plan. But I had a lot of trash bottles that I'd collected over the years. Sometimes you know you get bottles that you're like, okay, this is cute, but you don't really know what you're going to do with it. Um, in addition to that, I'd also always cut bottles in my house where I would cut things for kitchen spoons, bathroom toothbrush, vichanuo, stuff like that. And so in the process, a friend of mine invited me to someone else's house where the girl was selling painted bottles. And I thought like, wow, I know how to paint. I have bottles and I can take it a step further and cut them. So that's when I started the cutting, painting and Mokomaya was born. So where I started for literally, literally like the next day I came and started painting in this room we are sitting in. Um, and that was easy because I'd, I'm an artist by nature. And I've always had like paints and brushes and all those types of things around me. So it wasn't like I needed to go out and find any of the things that I needed. I already had what I needed with me. So it literally the next day I came in, I started um, cutting and painting. And then I started posting on Instagram, just like, you know, you know how during Corona everyone was baking, you know, whatever. So I was posting like, this is what I'm doing. And guys are like, are you selling? And I'm like, selling what? <laughs> you know, and so that's when I created a page for Mokomaya and began my first attempt into making it a business. So I actually already had the tools because like I said earlier, um, I did this at home as a hobby. So in my apartment, I would always cut bottles and turn them into like holders for different things. I just never painted them or really did anything beyond cutting. So it was, I didn't, I did not have to go looking for equipment initially. With time, I've, I've up added a few things here and there, but I am just now a year in looking into like real equipment. Otherwise, what I'm using so far, I had all along. I think you're never you're never sure of anything okay well I'm never sure about anything in this life but I think what I can say is as you as you get older you learn to trust your gut and it felt good and it felt right um, I didn't have the answers to a lot of things you know like in terms of business and you know where this was going to lead but I had the support of the family they also didn't know, I didn't know what I was being supported to do, but I, there was an environment where I could, I could experiment and try. My first client was someone that was shopping for a gift. There was a guy from Belgium who was staying with a family in Karen and he was referred to me through Instagram. And so he wanted something unique to take back to Belgium. So that was my first client and that's how I connected. And then from there is the confidence to to do my first market so I did my first market where I was able to display my goods and and just hear what people's response to the stuff was and made some more sales um, actually made good sales I was like why why are people buying this stuff so it kind of made me get my act together because in the, I didn't think anybody would buy and so when people bought then I was like okay time to to buckle up and do something real so the next step was, um, I didn't even actually go looking for bottles. What happened is when people saw me at my first market in Karen, guys were like, do you take bottles? Yeah. And that was when I got to learn that there's an actually trash problem in, in Kenya because on that first, the very first market, a lot of people were like, can we give you our bottles? We have bottles and it seems like every Kenyan has bottles in a store or in a shamba where they're like, I don't know what to do with them. They're just here. So I started going door to door with my car and just collecting when I was called by people. Um, I'm now, as I, got, as I grow, it's harder to now go door to door. So what we are doing is we are, we are setting up collection points where people can come in and drop um, their bottles. I still have a few people who I collect from individual homes, but that's usually a coordinated effort from like a multiple number of homes within the same, same area where like it's going to be a collection that's worth the effort. So in terms of when I say a bit more 
in terms of growth, it was the first market, like everything looked different. Like nothing had a theme. Everything was just like, I picked red in the morning, I painted red. I picked blue, that's what I did, yeah. Um, but now as I get um, more into the market, I'm doing a bit more coordination in terms of pieces so that if you come, you can get a set of glasses that match your vase, that match your holder, that match your carafe. Um, thinking a bit more thoroughly about the themes behind the color choices, the pattern choices, and also understanding what people like. People like African feel. And so in, initially when I started, it was very mandala based, which is a lot of sacred geometry, but then as I've explored the art a bit more, of course, when you start doing something, you go on Pinterest, you go on Instagram, you find other people who do the same thing, and you kind of, you know, create your own space and how you do your own thing. So that's basically been the evolution. My background is in design, right? So I have a, um, I have a, a lot of experience as a designer, a graphic designer. And so I'm able to apply theoretic knowledge from school that not necessarily every person that's painting bottles will have. So for instance, when it comes to understanding color, I've studied color as a, as a major in school, I mean, as a subject in school. So I'm able to understand how colors interact and how you balance colors when you put them together. I've been able to, I'm able to understand layout in a way that's a bit different. And so I bring that to what I do, yeah? So I'm not following necessarily like a pattern on IG. I'm creating my own pattern and I understand like how the science behind creating patterns. Yes, I quit my job and, and I think that job was the odd part. I don't think it was me to be employed. But I think what happened is I, I came back to Kenya from the US in 2011 and I sought out employment as a way to reintegrate into the society because when you don't have relationships and connections and networks in Kenya, it's very hard to navigate and figure out life. And so I felt that I initially started my job and started off as a volunteer job. So I used to volunteer, give my time once a week, then it evolved and became, I was a trainer, then it evolved, I became branding, social media management, and it became a nine years of working for the same company where I was like, whoa, what have I just done? Time to go. And so yes, so the job part is what was odd, not the entrepreneurial journey for me. The, there's an advantage in having watched parents who are self-employed. Um, in terms of, especially understanding the business is not like employment where it's like Musha Mwezi, you get paid and everything's great. Entrepreneurship is such a zigzag journey. Um, so in terms of preparation, I had that advantage. Um, in terms of education, I went to an art school in the US and the art school that I went to was, was focused on the arts. It was focused on being a great designer. So I can't really say that that part played anything to do with entrepreneurship. But I think the one thing, one advantage of creative um, studies is that you have the ability to make money here and there doing creative things for people, like I can design a caposta or a website. So you kind of are in that space even when you're in school, but you're not necessarily getting a formal training. I made a lot of mistakes. The biggest one that is, is always like the one I kick myself for today when I look back is how much money I spent at the beginning. You know, in the beginning it's like, oh, I want to do this, you do it, you know, and you, and you when someone tells you how much it costs, you're like, sure, you know. But then I look back now and I'm like, oh my gosh, I spent how much on what? Like, it's ridiculous because now I've learned so much about getting things done and stretching my coin. So I would say the biggest mistake has been spending before I understood the business. I think if I had the money I had when I started, I would have spent it differently. Um, how did I recover? You just do, you have no choice, you know? I think entrepreneurship is one of those journeys where it's an every day, every minute, every hour kind of thing. So today's a good day, great. You know, you kind of recover a little bit from the mistakes of yesterday. And tomorrow is a bad day, then you're back a little bit lower. And you just kind of do this dance until you get to the place I don't know what the place is I'm still on the journey so I can't really say like I have recovered and this is what I did to recover I think it's gen it's generally just a step by step and I obviously I don't think even those things that I did in the beginning that I regret were mistakes I think they were learning it was a learning curve because even as I'm walking this journey today I'm sure in a few months I'll look back and be like I could have just done one two three yeah
So the first step is usually to clean the bottle and then to, depending on what you intend to do with the bottle, because different bottle shapes will inspire different things, yeah? So depending on the shape of the bottle, you look at it and be like, ah, you know, like if you look at a bottle like this, if I cut it like here, it's a very skinny glass. So then like, what if I made it into a vase where someone could put it like at a, like a small table with like a flower, it does something differently. So being able to understand the shape of the bottle and what you intend to do and where you intend to cut it is like the first, first step. Once you've cleaned and you've identified how you'd like to cut it, then you, your next step is to score it. And when I say score, I mean like basically you're drawing a line with a tool. Usually it's a diamond tip that basically guides the line as to where you're going to, to cut. And once you cut, which is a heat and cold process, then you have to, to polish. And the polishing is probably the most intense part or the most involving part because you have to sand it using sanding paper, if you will, and you have to do different grades to get the, the smoothness that you desire. That's a physical activity. And then if you really want the smooth edges like these on the top, then you have to fire a bit on the, on the rim. So yeah. So once you get to that point, then you have your finished glass or item, then you start your, your painting process. So depending on if it's a single layer painting, so like there are some paintings where you're layering different colors. Like for instance, you can see like these are different colors on top of different colors. So you have to wait for one round to dry. If it's cold like it is right now or cool, then maybe you have to come back tomorrow to do the next layer. So it all depends on the design. A design like this one I'm doing is a bit more straightforward because it's a single color and it's just, once I'm done, I'm done. It's going to dry and by tomorrow, in two days, I'll be able to put it in the fire and cure it. Challenges. Obviously working with glass is a challenge because it just takes one slip and it breaks. So that's usually the biggest challenge is making sure that you're not breaking stuff. Um, the other thing would be maybe the cost. You know, the input versus what you're going to get for it because Sometimes you end up spending so much time on a single piece that pricing it, you know that no one is going to buy a glass for that much. So you have to really kind of play that balance. So those are some of the challenges I would say when it comes to pricing things that are based off of talent. Because people will be like, it's a glass. Why would I pay that much for a glass? But then you also know how much time you put into it, which then becomes a dance. So the price ranges for us start at 1500 all the way to about 15k. 15k you're looking at your mirrors, we do mirrors as well and we do um, wall hooks and stuff like that but when it comes to like a set of four drinking glasses you're looking at about 2500-3500 bob. Um, we also work with artisans that do work in brass and so we produce stuff like this which allows us to then take our product to our next level where we have like a lid and you have like the grass, glass, the brass rim. And so something like this is more costly because number one, the material and the cost of brass, the artisans to do this is also a cost that you have to consider. So those items tend to cost a bit higher. So something like this would be like 2,500, 3,500 for one versus a set of glasses that you can get at the same price. Um, most of my business has been market driven in terms of artisan, artisan markets in Nairobi. And so I think one of the toughest decisions financially is to make a decision, for me I had to make a decision at some point to stop going for markets. And to really limit how many markets I was physically taking my product to. Because I realized that it was um, a scenario where I would take, you pack up your car, your goods, you go to the market, you've spent money to, to be in the market as a vendor. You get there, maybe you broke one on the way, and then while you're there, it's like you're just kind of hanging around. And I realized that the market space in Nairobi has gotten very saturated, so you find that it's become a business. So the person hosting the market is not really invested in what you're selling, they're invested in like as many vendors as possible to pay their 3K, come and get a table. Whether you sell or don't, it's none of their business. It's also a risk you have to take in business. And so at that point, I had to think, you know, what's the next strategy that can work better? So for me now, I'm working with retail outlets, which is better because you have a shelf space that's guaranteed that you will have eyes that fall on those items at some point during the month, you'll have different traffic. And so now studying those, because those also cost. So you have to kind of spend money to make money. And so we're slowly connecting with the kind of retail space that, that embraces what we do. The, the glass that breaks when we're done, we either crush and um, create 
items that involve um, mixing concrete and grout into like a different item altogether and sometimes we've also now that we've been here a bit longer we've connected with someone who does countertops from broken glass so we give them our broken glass they give us bottles that we may want because then we can at least be selective about the kind of bottle we want from him so we have now created relationships where we're like okay this guy needs broken glass we also have guys who do fences so they'll come to you and you know the security fences that people do so sometimes people come and say like, I need a gunia of glass. And so um, there's different options for what you can do with your broken glass. Um, insecure, I think money is always that thing that makes you a bit like, you know, you're spending, like you want to see it come back. Um, and also, you know, people's reaction. You know, sometimes I think when you are creative, you love what you do so much and you hope that people are seeing what you're seeing. And so sometimes you have that kind of insecurity where it's like, do they like it? Are they gonna like it? What do they think, you know? And so that can be a bit of a hindrance because I remember like sometimes there, there are things which I made like a year ago and like I still can't post on Instagram, but people will walk in here and accidentally see, they're like, oh my God, this is so nice. I want to buy, I'm like, huh? Of everything that I have posted, you've chosen this one thing. And so getting over that is something that I think a, a process with time, you know, and you, you get to realize that it's not your taste that's your customer. Your customer has different tastes from what you have. So your insecurities about what they may think have no place in this whole equation. My measure of success is um, people understanding and connecting with what I do. Um, you're not always going to get a sale out of people, but you're always going to get a response in terms of like, this is amazing, it makes so much sense, why is nobody else doing this? Like this, there are people who get so excited about seeing like, taka taka becomes what it is that we are seeing in front of us. So for me, that's my measure of success, is people who really connect with what I do and appreciate it. So not all clients will know what, what, what they want, yeah? But they'll look at yourself and be like, I know I want something, right? And so sometimes it's about walking them through the journey of, okay, is it something for decoration or for use? Like, do you want to put something in it? Do you want it to just sit there and be like something pretty, right? Um, I'll give you an example. Today I had a lady who called me and she has a house where she, she's like, oh, I have orange, ochre, and red in my house. Those are the three colors that are everywhere. And she's like, I want glasses, I want ashtrays, I want blah, blah, blah. And she's like, you know, yeah. So give me like, so I'm like, okay, so let's go through what shape do you want square or round? So you kind of walk them through like eliminating what they don't want so that you can get closer to what they want. And so we were able to like, okay, she wants square for this and round for this. She wants um, this much color on, on one versus I want a lot of like color on this one. So we were able to settle on like the design choice, the shape choice and the color choice very easily. Um, some people are like, let me just see what you have, then I'll decide. And that becomes very hard because it's like I have stuff in a shop in Karen, I have stuff in a shop in Roslyn, I have stuff in here. So it's like, do I take a picture of everything? Like it's very, it's, and then so sometimes Instagram really comes in handy there because you can say, check out my IG page, look around, see if there's something there that kind of perks your interest and then let's go from there. I have learned that you must be patient um, because lack of patience can really get in the way of progress because sometimes you want things to happen, you want them to happen now, you want people to respond now, you want them to buy now, you want to sell out now, you know, and it doesn't quite happen the way you want it to happen. Um, and so that has been one great lesson. Second lesson I would say is be excited. Be excited about what you're doing and, and willing to like, you know, discover new ways of doing what you're doing, you know, not, not be stuck on this is how you do it. Like always open your mind to like, oh, I could try do it this way. And the third thing is delegate. You know, allow yourself to have people that come in and carry certain loads so that you're not the person carrying everything. I think in the beginning, because I was a creative and I know it's in my head, I'm like, get out of my way. But then now slowly I'm learning to like, this is my guy for Mbao, this is my guy for Brass, this is my guy for this, and, and that kind of helps me be a more functional designer um, for Mokomaya.
few words that would best describe me um curious um outgoing um brave yeah I think the mantra I live by is just to, to create, to just keep creating. I think for me, that's where my, my, my passion lies in the creation. I feel like the rest of it will come into place in its own time. But I think that the, the best thing I can do for myself and the one thing I have to remind myself is to create because there are days when you just don't feel like doing it, like you're over it. I want to shut it down, like this was a bad idea. Why did I ever think, you know? And then it's like, okay, I'll just come in here and paint a few hours and I'm like, oh, I'm excited about it again. So for me, it's creating. I have to stay creating. What would I tell someone trying to, you know, a youth or a young person trying to get into business? I would say, number one, it's, it's not for the faint hearted. It's something that requires some patience, but it's also something that requires that you believe in yourself. Because I think that business is a very lonely experience and sometimes you have to answer and encourage yourself because there's there's just no one to do that and there's nobody's coming to save you so you have to really be excited and, and really focused on what it is that you're you're pursuing um i would say that there's opportunity if you just look um when i look at what i'm doing right now this is trash and paint and a few tools it's not that it's nothing but it's it's doable so it's just identifying where is the need for me, I was able to identify people like nice things, people like unique things. I have a gift where I'm able to create unique things and nice things. And here I am.